Raven pulled and scrambled her way to a sitting position, shoulder to shoulder with her fellow captive. Despite the nip in the room, sweat trickled down her spine. Listen to me, father. You keep praying to God. Lord knows we could use his help, she urged. But until he comes through, you gotta get this tape off me. You and I have some planning to do. He stopped his prayer, but the man didn't move. She had to find another way to sway him. I'm not gonna leave you, father. You understand me? Silence. Eventually, he reached for her, struggling to set her free. Unable to see his face, she had no way to read him. It would be difficult enough to get herself out of this mess. In a fight, the reluctant priest would be an albatross around her neck. But she didn't have a choice. The life of another human being was in her hands. She had to try. Yet despite being in the company of a holy man, she vowed one thing. If this was her time to die, she'd take Logan McBride with her. Chapter 16 Christian crept along the brick wall of the deserted warehouse, eyes alert. He hadn't found his SUV yet, but Bill Edwards and the GPS readings had led him to this place, and with his latest discovery he followed a thin trail, as thin as a wisp of smoke. The cleansing storm had left the air crisp in its wake, but in the dying breeze a scent lingered, and like a predator he followed. Although deep shadows deceived his eyes, he relied more on his other senses to guide him. Christian had mastered the technique, the sensation arousing him. He never felt so alive as when he hunted. And his skill held another side benefit. Putting all his efforts into the chase, he forgot his fear of the dark, the weakness that defined him. But in his war room skirmishes at the Dunhill estate, no one died. Tonight would be different. Up ahead, a faint red glow drew his attention, fading in and out at irregular intervals. He crouched low and breathed in the scent, listening for what he knew would follow, the crunch of gravel on asphalt, the scuff of a shoe. Cigarette smoke provided the trail, tinged by the stench embedded in the clothes of the target. The guard had been careless. He peered through the darkness, then allowed an inner peace to take root. Eyes closed, he slowed his heart rate to heighten his awareness, feeling the oppressive weight of the stranger displacing air with his pacing. He tasted the man's proximity with the whole of his senses. Slowly, Christian advanced, his muscles tensed in anticipation. Soon he'd be close enough to— A shadow moved to his left. He dropped to the ground on instinct, flat on his belly. The wet, cold ground seized his skin. What the hell? Alert to any noise, he waited. A dark silhouette prowled, unaware of his presence. He listened for the man to make his move, unsure what that might be, but he soon got his answer. In one fluid motion, the guard was taken out. His body dropped to the ground with only his dying breath to mark his passing. The execution flawless. Only the glint of a knife revealed the weapon used in the stealthy kill, caught in the pale light from the moon. The assassin melded into the shadows as if he were never there. Who else hunted with him? Did he have an ally or a new enemy? So intent on his prey, he nearly missed the movement himself. A humbling experience. Now, if he wanted to make contact, how would he do it without getting himself killed? Only one way came to mind. He evaluated his options, the opportunity for cover being minimal. Yet it might work. Christian tensed his jaw, fortifying his determination. The odds of getting inside and saving Raven worsened with the added wrinkle. He'd have to confront this new adversary. And given the man's skill, his abilities in the dark would be put to the test. Even inside gloves, her hands felt sticky. The blood soaked through. The kill had its merits, but cleanliness was not one of them. 
Jasmine cleared the outside perimeter, the last of the guards dispatched without challenge. Now she would burrow into the darkened warehouse through the passageway she'd found on an earlier scouting trip. Nicholas had released her to hunt McBride. Relishing the thought, she smiled. Nicky always did know how to please a woman. But as she inched her way along the wall toward the rear of the building, she heard a faint sound, almost undetectable. A single beep, loud enough to spoil her plan. The sound carried on the cool night air. Unsure of its origin, she peered through the dark, searching the shadows for any sign of movement. As she neared a corner, Jasmine squared her back to the wall, cautiously moving forward. With a turn of her head, she edged close enough for a sideways glance. The space had once been some kind of storage unit. Its door hung lopsided off one of its hinges. Adjacent to the main building, it did not give access to McBride's stronghold, so she considered it useless. Oddly enough, the noise came from within. Perhaps she dismissed the importance of the room too hastily after all. She looked inside. The place conjured up an old memory. Broker of death. Nicky had called her that once. Being a death dealer, Jasmine believed it far better to give than to receive. But with the interior of the bunker completely black, it possessed all the qualities of a crypt. It felt more like an omen of her mortality, leaving her edgy. Yet with the door wide open and busted, a bluish haze cast into the space, reassuring her. She would be in and out quickly. In the far corner, an object lay on the cement floor. It reflected a pale light onto a brick wall, partially hidden under refuse. It looked as if someone had dropped a cell phone. As she stepped within earshot, the beeping sound took on a rhythm, a steady chirp. It wasn't intimidating in the least, but its power-driven nature sent a clear message. Someone had been there. Crouching low, she checked her surroundings one final time. Trusting her instincts, she sensed no one and slipped closer to the object, eyes focused on the glow. She removed debris, making the light more conspicuous. A phone? By the time she laid her hands on it, she realized her fatal mistake. Impaired by the light, her night vision was temporarily useless. Then she heard it. The door of the bunker wedged shut, throwing her into total darkness except for the dim glow of the phone's display. She shut it down, not wanting to draw attention to her location. Fortified for the kill, she moved left, relying on her senses to guide her. The air felt thick with the presence, the sensation elusive and indefinable. Most remarkable. Even the faintest sound reverberated inside the compact structure. She held her breath, not giving any advantage to her new adversary. Although cornered, she prepared to fight. Her hand reached for the gun in her thigh holster. A voice emerged from the void, deflecting off the walls. No need for the gun. I'm just here to talk. The man whispered, moving as he spoke, making it impossible to pinpoint his location. Her eyes followed the sound as it rebounded off the walls, but even more disturbing, the voice sounded familiar. Normally she prided herself on composure under fire, yet this completely baffled her. And how did he see her movements? Surely the darkness encumbered him in the same manner. The man moved too quietly to be laden with night vision gear. Very intriguing. She must know more. Why do you hide in the shadows? I am only a defenseless woman, more afraid of you than you should be of me. Using her femininity to bait the trap, she would draw him out, a practiced maneuver. She knew from experience that his ego would do the rest. But to her surprise, the man stifled a laugh, a low, sensual sound with a familiar ring of intimacy. Lady, you scare the hell out of me, but I'd still like to talk. The cell phone. Is it yours? she asked. Yes, 
just my way to reach out and touch someone. As he replied, she powered up the cell and hit the function menu to find his name in the registry, allowing her body to be edged in light. But the only name on the display caused her to rethink killing him. Dunhill Corporation. With keen interest, she searched for the man, eager for a glimpse. You move well, she tempted him with flattery. Come closer, so we may talk. As appealing as that sounds, this is not a game for me. The man changed his tone, forgoing the subterfuge of his whisper. He stepped forward, risking a show of good faith. She admired strength, a quality so few possessed. I have someone inside who needs my help, he admitted, so I have one thing to say. This promises to be interesting. She resorted to her usual sarcasm. But as the man drew near, curiosity won out. She took a risk of her own, powering up the cell phone to shine its light. As his face emerged from the shadows, she nearly forgot to breathe. The uncanny resemblance stunned her. The strong jawline, the full lips, and those most expressive eyes. She swallowed hard. It took great discipline to hide her reaction. Still, there remained no doubt in her mind. Nicholas Charbonneau had a son. Softening her voice, Jasmine encouraged him. Please, enlighten me. You either help me or get out of my way. I don't have time for a debate. His confidence fascinated her, and his underlying message held much more than an idle threat. She saw it in his eyes. A smile curved her lips. Suddenly, things had gotten much more interesting. A woman. She wouldn't give her name, and he returned the favor, keeping his anonymity. This wasn't a social occasion. With a watchful eye, Christian followed her to a rusted dumpster. Behind it, she stashed her gear and knelt beside it, rummaging through the contents. By the light of the moon, he observed the woman. Dressed in black with a Kevlar vest for added protection, she wore a thigh-holstered glock and a knife in her belt. If Christian didn't know better, he'd swear she looked like part of a police tactical team. But something in her manner told him she wouldn't play by anyone's rules, especially on the side of law enforcement. And what connection did she have to the men inside? He didn't have time to find out. I'd like my phone back. I do not believe it would be in my best interest to comply. You might call the authorities, she reasoned. With or without your cooperation, that's done. If I don't make a call saying my friend inside is safe and sound, my man has been instructed to call the cops. He glanced at his watch, illuminating the dial with the push of a button. In thirty minutes. But I can't wait for the cavalry, not knowing what's happening inside. The woman quit rifling through her belongings and stiffened at the mention of police. I can't be a part of this if the police come. Once I see flashing red cherry, I don't care what's going on. I'm out. Not a part of this. He found her eyes in the dark. Then why are you here? I have my reasons. Her voice low, she focused on her bag once again. Not good enough, lady. He didn't appreciate her evasive response, and time had run out. The urgency of his predicament tested his tolerance. You don't have a say in what I do. She narrowed her eyes in defiance. I scouted this location, and I know another way in. It will take longer to get into position, but you will like the advantage. As I see it, you need me. Need you for what, exactly? He didn't wait for an answer. I'm gonna ask you again, why are you here? For a moment, he thought she would refuse to answer, but eventually she explained. I am only after one man. 
Once I have acquired my target, you are on your own. I have no interest in the woman or the little priest. Priest, what priest? Part of him wanted to understand her involvement; another part wanted to leave her behind, bound and gagged. He resisted the latter. She might prove to be useful, but who was this man she wanted to kill? He realized he made an assumption she would kill him. From what he'd seen, the woman didn't come to chat. And who the hell was this priest? Damn it! He had to remain focused. Raven needed his help. They took a priest from Saint Sebastian's, used him as bait to lure the pretty detective. Who knows? Maybe the men inside felt the need for confession. Her smile lacked any real humor. No doubt spawned more from a perverse nature. How do you know the woman is a detective, and that the priest was abducted from Saint Sebastian's? He remembered Bill giving him the coordinates for the church. He'd recognized the address from his frequent visits to the cemetery, but according to his security man, the SUV didn't stay long. Now things were beginning to make sense. I know a lot of things. Her only reply: Just do what you came to do, then get out. I can take care of the rest. He knelt by her, gazing down at the canvas bag. And I don't want any casualties from friendly fire. What kind of firepower did you bring? Friendly? The more he knew about this woman, the more the word friendly failed to apply. She wasn't the warm and fuzzy type. Far from it. He watched as she powered up a small flashlight. She held it in her teeth to free up her hands, shining the small beam into the black rucksack. To his astonishment, the light reflected onto a small arsenal. Flashbangs, grenades. Who the hell were you intending to fight? A small third world country? He touched her shoulder to get her attention. They've got hostages. You can't use the grenades in such tight quarters. She took the flashlight from her teeth, switching it off. I will admit the hostages do pose a complication. Just think of my preparedness as overkill. Besides, I had no intention of being a hero. I only want the one. If Christian thought she would help. That hope crumbled into a thousand pieces. With the woman's only goal being her mission, he'd be on his own. Detecting his reaction, she liberally dosed him with sarcasm. Butch and Sundance, good movie, but I work alone. Now what can you use? We're running out of time. I'll take the knife, and a flashbang. His hand retrieved what he needed. Then he stood. That's it. Mentally preparing for the next step, he held the flashbang in his hand. More of a diversionary device used by police tactical teams, the weapon would be useful to render night vision useless for a time. A fuel air explosive. The device ignited particles of aluminum powder through small holes in the bottom of the canister. Reacting with oxygen to produce an acoustic pulse and a brilliant flash of light. Once it was activated, detonation would occur within two seconds. The device would set off a deafening explosion of blinding light, leaving anyone within range of the blast dazed and seeing stars for up to six seconds. His hearing temporarily out of commission. Perfect for what he had in mind, but he'd have to pick his spot to use it. The effects of the blast would be temporary. Diversion. His plan centered on it. He would stall until the police arrived. I've got night vision binoculars with a built-in boom mic. You sure you don't want something more high tech? She pocketed what she needed in her tactical vest and gazed up at him. After zipping the bag, she stood and hoisted it over her shoulder. That'll only slow me down," he shook his head, slipping the canister in the pocket of his coat. "In the dark, muzzle flash will blind you, so be careful. If you have to shoot, no ricochets. Make damned sure of your target. I don't want anything to happen to the hostages, or me. 
Your skill in the dark is truly a gift," she observed. Standing by his side, she smiled again. This time, the humor reached her eyes. If we both get out of this alive, perhaps you can show me more. His mind already distracted by the hunt, he ignored the sexual innuendo in her voice. Just show me what you got, lady. Lead the way. Now remember, father. Stick close to me and keep your hand on my shoulder, so I know where you are. It's going to be as dark out there as it is in here. I don't want to lose you. I'll remember. Yes. His nerves were fraying. She heard it in his voice. For his sake, she fortified her own. If we get separated, just find a hole and hide until I find you. Raven held the man's shoulders, giving them a firm squeeze. Unable to see his face, she relied on her hands to convey the message. Once we get out of this room, no talking. It'll only make us a target. I understand, detective. The priest's voice quivered. She spoke with authority, more for his benefit. In reality, she knew the odds weren't good. A sucker's bet. And keep praying, Father. Silently, we're going to need it. The creak of the door heralded the start of the game for McBride, but for her and Father Antonio, it would be a fight for their lives. Once she got into the corridor, she stopped to reconnoiter, waving a hand in front of her face. She couldn't see a thing. The staleness of the air stifled her breath, but any chance for freedom lay ahead. She had no choice but to move. One hand along the wall, she felt for direction, then extended her other arm in front like a buffer. It would be slow going. She tried to visually recall the length of the corridor to give it substance in her mind. Without a notion of up or down, vertigo played havoc with her senses, her equilibrium short-circuiting, and with every step, the grip of the priest tightened. The man expected to be attacked at any time. And she couldn't argue the point. Being a sadistic bastard, McBride wouldn't play by any rules. So why not have a man stationed in the dark hallway, ready to pounce? To some degree, the priest's hand comforted her. She wasn't alone, but his grasp also served as a reminder that she held his life in her hands. Cautious with each step, she moved forward. The grit on the wall caked her fingertips. She listened for any sound, but the priest's breathing would mask much of it. She prayed his fear wouldn't get them both killed. Halfway, she believed half the corridor lay behind them. The real fight would soon begin. Despite the chill, sweat trickled from her temples and trailed down her spine under her clothes. The sensation played on her nerves, feeling more like the uninvited touch of McBride's finger. His despicable sneer haunted her memory, and in the dark, that image loomed larger than she cared to admit. As she neared the end of the corridor, she crouched low, pulling Father Antonio with her. Her mind tried to recall the layout of the place. She never got a good look. McBride said there was only one way out, but had that been a lie too? Her gut wrenched with the weight of her decision. Once beyond the cover of the hallway, if she turned the wrong direction, she might seal their fate with a mistake. Her fingers found the edge of the wall as it crooked into the cavernous warehouse. Time to fight or die. Her instincts would have to take charge. She didn't have the luxury of deliberating her actions. She tensed her muscles, ready to make her first move. But in that instant. Her thoughts turned to Christian and his unique sensory gifts. Slowly, she closed her eyes and trusted her inner voice, knowing that voice would be his. Deep within the center of the labyrinth, in a spot especially made for him, Logan crouched with his night vision headgear activated. A creak of a door warned that the hunt had begun. And from his vantage point, he would watch his prey move along the corridor, then into the maze. Bodies edged in a kaleidoscope of pale greens and reds. The barricade construction only allowed his quarry to come toward him, tricking them into believing escape was possible. 
but nothing could be further from the truth. Raven and the priest would be served up, warm and breathing, delivered center stage, with him as the star of the engagement. Perfect! His fingers reached for the knife attached to his belt. His thumb stroked the handle, with the motion gaining momentum, matching his adrenaline rush. He loved the advantage night vision gear gave him, but it deprived him of one very essential element of the hunt. He lived to see fear in their eyes and smell defeat oozing from the pores of their skin after they accepted their fate, giving their bodies to him. Every fiber in his being cried out for that sensation. It empowered him. Even now, blood churned in his groin. His body hardened with his imaginings. His need to experience the intimacy of death up close compelled him to use a knife for the kill. He had no choice. It was an aspect of his nature he refused to ignore. His thoughts fixed on Raven. The smell of her blood already teased his fertile imagination. He pictured her body writhing in death, thrashing against his grip. The flesh of his cheeks grew warm. Without the ability to control his impulse, he quit stroking the knife, a poor substitute. He shoved his hand into his pants, unable to wait for the release that only the kill delivered. He focused on his need, his breathing urgent and shallow. Then she appeared. Raven being the smaller figure in front, she led the priest to the end of the corridor, then stopped. He would take her first, making the priest an easy target. Two kills nearly sent him over the edge. His efforts grew more frenzied until... A motion to his right deprived him of gratification. Shit! He cursed under his breath. Someone else had joined the party. Unannounced. Who the hell came without an invitation, and how had they gained access from that location? The intrusion fueled a slow-burning rage. Reluctantly, he pulled his hand free. A sneer warped his face. Whoever it was, they'd have to wait their turn to die. He heard the paintball rounds slamming below, his men already launching an assault. But given the location of the intruders, the pallets would do no good. The meddlers had too much of an advantage— and to complicate matters, Raven and the priest had moved into the maze, with two of his men focused on them. Switching to predator mode, he moved out of his bunker, howling like an animal into the void, his unique signal. The eyes of his men were on him. With a motion of his right hand, he gave the signal. Time to play in earnest. Time for Plan B. Raven heard the paint gun blasts erupting from above, the sound reverberating through the hollow cavern. What the hell were they shooting at? Father Antonio gripped her shoulder, giving it a tug. Adhering to her rules about not talking, the man gave her the only sign possible. He wanted to know what was happening, and so did she. To reassure him, she fumbled for his hand. The token gesture would have to do for now. A barrage of paintball pellets hurled to the floor, McBride's men obviously targeting a spot across the room. That meant only one thing. Someone else had joined the fray, maybe providing a diversion for her and the priest to escape. Hands out in front of her, she left the security of the wall. She crouched low and moved right with the priest in tow, away from the altercation. Thud! Smack! Two rounds struck her in the arm and back, splattering liquid over her face and clothes. And by the way her companion reacted, he'd been hit too. The smell familiar, she remembered her investigation at the church and her meeting with the M.E. The odor of isopropyl alcohol choked her. Its vapor stung her eyes. She wiped her face, trying to relieve the burn. Keep moving. Don't make an easy target. As she picked up her pace, the toe of her boot clipped something heavy. She fell to the floor, dragging Father Antonio with her. The weight of his body knocked the wind out of her. Her throat raw, she heaved to fill her lungs, taking a moment to recover. Thwack! She shielded her head with an arm, then rolled to her knees. Inching her way forward, she crawled on all fours, feeling along the cement with Father Antonio right behind her. Eventually, she found cover against some kind of barricade. 
She extended her arm across the priest to protect and reassure him. Zing! Splat! Dodging pellets, she kept her head down, shoving a shoulder into a wall of damp burlap, judging by the smell and the coarse weave. The moldy odor was tainted by the toxic vapor of the chemical. From her investigation of the Blair murder site, she knew this point started the death maze. A cold reality hit. In his ordeal, Mickey Blair had no way out of his trap. McBride made sure of that. Why would her chances be any better? He dangled the carrot of hope, telling her a way out existed. Raven knew now. The bastard lied. Not knowing what was happening on the other side of the room, she took a chance. To find another way out, she'd have to risk exposure, do the unexpected. And with the diversion across the room, this might be the only time to do it. You stay here, she whispered to the priest, her voice raspy. But when I call, you follow my voice. I'm going to try to crawl over the top. Give you a hand up. She stood and drew fire. Pellets whizzed by her head and pummeled her back. She ignored the painful bruising of the attack and held her breath from the fumes. One foot wedged into a niche in the burlap sacks. She raised her hand above her head and dug into the barricade for a grip. The structure felt sturdy enough to support her weight, but situated at an odd slant, the wall made it difficult to hoist herself up. Finally, she took a step up, clinging to the burlap. Her arm wedged into it, but as she reached to pull herself over, her hand recoiled in pain. Ah! A chill shot across her skin. In her shock, stars spiraled through the darkness, assaulting her eyes. Something sharp had pierced her hand, shredding flesh as she slid away. Blood drained warm down her arm, the cuts deep. Thud. Another round struck the back of her neck, dousing her. She fell to the cement floor, hard. Her hand stung as the alcohol mixed with blood, the wound swollen and throbbing. Damn it! She groaned, tucking her hand against her waist, applying pressure to the cut with her other arm. Oh, God, won't do that again. What happened? The priest knelt by her side. Nails, glass, something up top. It'll cut us to pieces if we try to scramble over. Are you hurt? Not much, Father, she lied. Come on, we gotta move. She gestured for the priest to follow. Now, no other choice remained. She had to pool her resources with whoever else was involved in the fight. By sheer numbers, they might muscle their way through the labyrinth. But she knew the risk. In the heat of battle, would the other target of McBride's men allow her to get close enough to explain, or would they kill her on the spot as the enemy? In her mind, there was only one way to find out. Another pellet whizzed by Christian's head as he ducked against a small barricade. Without having a clear shot, the men above had curtailed their steady barrage for now. He and his strange companion had already taken out two men. They lay unconscious at their feet. He felt the obstacle of their body mass, even in the dark. The advantage I spoke of earlier? The mysterious Asian woman whispered and tugged at his sleeve, pulling him toward a more massive obstruction. She placed his hand onto it. We are on the backside of the barricade. We shall have full access to the scaffolding above and to his men. With another gesture, she indicated the stairway to the left. I will take the other side. Do not keep track of me. I will stay clear of you. She drew a hand to his cheek. He hadn't expected it. Never saw it coming. Christian flinched at her familiarity. Apparently, his reticence amused her. May we both live to fight another day. After a soft chuckle, she added, And I do hope we meet again. I believe you will find we have much more in common. What the hell did that mean? The woman had a fondness for being cryptic. Christian said nothing in return. He suspected sentimentality would appear trite to this woman. She left his side to hunt on her own. He preferred it that way, too. From the sound of it, she drew fire. The pellets pummeled the floor to his left. 
But soon after, he became a target again, hearing the chemical-loaded ammo zip by his head. He evaded much of it. But the alcohol vapors grew stronger, screwing with his sense of smell. Much more of this, and he wouldn't be able to trust his perceptions. From their sniper positions above, the men could hold out for a long time, bombarding pellets from their aerial perches. As the woman advised, he would take his fight to them, eliminating them one at a time. Closing his eyes, he listened for a consistent blast from above and a soft creak in the metal grating, acquiring his next target. Imagining the staircase configuration, he would move to where he believed steps to be. But first, he prepared himself. Deep breath. Shutting his eyes, he found his center and searched for his quiet inner voice. Now let it go. Slow. The familiar mantra calmed him. His heart slowed. Just like the war room, he reminded himself. It helped to believe that. Then a new image replaced the old and familiar. Raven Mackenzie. Ever since he'd met her, she'd never strayed far from his heart. Now would be no different. Scanning through her night-vision binoculars, Jasmine located her targets, eavesdropping on their candid whispers with a boom mic. Two men stood near the railing of the catwalk, their paintball guns aimed below, carrying handguns in thigh holsters. No doubt smug with their lofty advantage, they didn't hear her come up behind them. These men were isolated from the rest. Easy pickings. Jasmine reached into her vest pocket and withdrew the flashbang canister. She formulated her attack and visualized every detail in preparation. She would have only seconds to take them out before they reached for their guns. She initiated the canister and tossed it at the first man's feet, then ducked for cover. She kept her eyes on the target until the very last second. It bounced twice, clacking to a stop inches from the man. By design, the sound drew the attention of both men. One second. She covered her ears and hunched against a nearby wall, waiting for the blast. Two seconds. Boom! Blinding white light seared the dark. A glowing ball of fire radiated like a shockwave in all directions, followed by a billowing stench. Being in closer proximity to the detonation, the men were shoved to the walkway with its thunderous force. The blast resonated along the walkway, making the steel hum in vibration. She knew from experience that the fierce image would leave its imprint on the eyes of the men. The white light would hang suspended in darkness, then splinter into spangles, blurring the vision of anyone looking directly at it. In a daze, the men would have minimal hearing, registering only muffled sounds. She had only seconds to gain advantage. Jasmine leapt from cover and grabbed the collar of the first man as he sprawled on his back, yanking him off the scaffold. In a practiced maneuver, she thrust the knife across his throat, severing cartilage. Warm blood doused her clothing. The sound of it pattered her vest like rain. The man screamed, but the sound warped into a moist gurgle. Then silence. The second man rolled to one side, reaching for her. Jasmine sprang to her feet and kicked his elbow, hyperextending it. She heard it crack with the force of her foot. As he writhed in pain, she rolled him onto his belly. Yanking a clump of hair, she flexed his head back to expose his neck. Within seconds, it was over. Two down. Jasmine tore off the headgear of the dead men, shining a dim light onto slack faces. McBride was not among them. She cleaned off the blade of her knife, wiping it across the chest of one of the dead men. A commotion caused her to look up. She heard the rumble along the scaffolding. Others were coming. Jasmine scrambled for cover down the graded steps, wedging her small frame inside a crate she had modified at the base of the stairs behind the stockade. Even if Logan's men strafed her location with night vision, she would appear invisible. As long as the room lay in darkness, she would snipe their positions without detection. It was a good plan. But what of Nikki's son? No. She had only one target, and taking on someone else's fight could get her killed. 
Besides, the police would soon overrun the place. This was not her fight. The police. She grimaced at the thought of their intrusion. She needed a shortcut to ID McBride. Jasmine reached for her binoculars and stuck the earpiece to the microphone into her ear. Rising from her hiding place, she scanned the remaining men. Across the floor of the warehouse, within the confines of the stockade, one man stood out from the rest. He directed the others with sweeping gestures rather than verbal commands. It had to be McBride. Then she heard the roar of another flashbang from above. Its piercing light cast elongated shadows on the brick walls for an instant. Then it was gone. Taken off guard by the explosion, she felt a jolt of pain slice through her brain as the bright light blinded her. But the echo of the blast lingered long after the light faded, resounding off the brick walls. When her vision cleared, she swept her binoculars across the room and into the rafters, looking for her comrade in arms. Curiosity, or concern? She made no distinction. Locating her target, she marvelled at his sensory skill, then smiled. Jasmine loved a man who understood the finesse of a kill. But soon her attention shifted back to McBride. He moved out from cover, and so did she. Yet from the direction Logan headed, Nicky's son would not be pleased. Christian plugged his ears against the blast, tightly closing his eyes to retain his night vision. The metal scaffolding vibrated under his boots. After the smoke blew past him, its smell dissipated in the chilly air. He listened for any sound of the men taken out by the detonation. A moan, the rustle of fabric, a hand gripped the tail of his coat. He had to move quickly. The sound of heavy breathing drew him in, giving him a target nearly waist high. He reached for the man's collar and tugged him forward, ripping the night vision gear from his head. Disoriented, the mercenary swayed as he tried to stand. Christian balled his fist and punched, connecting with the man's jaw. He felt it give way on the second blow, then finished with an uppercut. As his target lost consciousness, he released his grip and let the body tumble to the grating in a heap. But too much time had elapsed. The disorienting effects of the flashbang had worn off. A second man grabbed his shoulder and spun him around. A fist buried deep into his ribs lifted him from the catwalk. Another blow nearly took his head off. He stumbled back, shaking his head to clear the fog. It didn't take long for him to recover. Both fists up in defense, Christian lowered his chin and launched his attack, pummeling the man with combination punches to the body. He stepped toward the aggressor, beating him senseless. His opponent teetered back on his heels, focusing his intensity. He spun to his right, ramming a kick to the man's gut. The mercenary fell against the metal railing. The air forced from his lungs, but to his surprise, the man remained standing. No time for fair play. Without mercy, Christian lowered his center of gravity and hoisted the man up, shoving him across the railing. Christian suspected the hurdle would do damage, but little else. The top of the barricade below would break his fall. His objective had always been Raven's safety, not to kill. But when the body dropped to the burlap barrier, he heard a blood-curdling scream. The pitiable cry echoed through the emptiness until the body toppled to the cement floor with a heavy thud. Then utter stillness. What the hell happened? Why did he scream like he was being ripped in two? Christian dropped to a knee, peering through the darkness as if sight were possible. He sensed death below, smelled the blood, and another thought gripped his heart. Raven was in greater danger. He just knew it. She had no idea what was going on. A battle raged above. Without knowing the players, Raven avoided the crossfire. Seeking shelter for her and Father Antonio, she hunkered next to a stockade wall. She recognized the flashbang detonations from her training with tactical. Even through all the chaos, a tinge of hope survived. The men of Logan McBride were falling one at a time. It had to be good news. Father Antonio gripped her hand, his palms damp. 
An occasional whisper escaped his lips, but despite her rules about not talking, she let him be. His prayers were welcome. Raven cursed the never-ending emptiness. She closed her eyes, resting her head against the barricade. Her thoughts turned to the rhythm of the priest's prayers, finding comfort in the act, and she joined him, a tear of acceptance rolling down her cheek. But the quiet didn't last. A faint scratching to her right. The sound gripped her, conjuring a revolting image in her mind. A frenzied screech. The irregular patter of small feet scurried toward her. With all the commotion, the rat population had been disturbed. She heard it coming. More than one hairy rodent headed by her. Raven gasped, unable to avoid a reaction. Not wanting to make a sound, she closed her eyes tight. She hugged her arms around herself and drew her knees to her chest. Holy mother of... Apparently Father Antonio had no great fondness for God's lowly creature. Slowly, Raven forced herself to move, raising a hand to the lips of the priest to silently warn him to be quiet. Repulsed by the filthy vermin, Raven trembled. Beads of sweat layered her body and dampened her clothes, a contradiction to the chill in the air. Her stomach wrenched with nausea. A rat bumped her hip. The nails of its feet scraped her pant leg as it started to climb. Her skin prickled, an unforgettable chill. She jabbed an elbow and shoved the damned thing, its weight branding her memory. But as the creature slithered away, she instinctively turned the other way. A new presence fueled her panic, looming overhead, and without the benefit of her eyesight, fear overwhelmed her. She scooted against the wall, her arm clutched Father Antonio. Someone stood above them. She felt it. Gritting her teeth, she steadied herself for a fight. She pictured Logan McBride, gray dead eyes. The feel of his fingernail skimmed the surface of her skin, sending the chill of revulsion down her spine. She'd been in the dark far too long. The deprivation and the strain played tricks on her mind. Cruel images jutted from memory like a drug-induced hallucination, a torturous strobe effect. Gruesome images of past murder cases flickered before her. The glazed eyes of the dead hurled out of the shadows until— Mickey Blair's death grimace. In her mind, she pictured him still hanging on the cross, his head slanted in grisly detail, exposing a gash so deep it nearly severed his head. The image spawned a waking nightmare. The dead man's face warped into her own reflection, her throat slashed. The smell of blood threatened to smother her. Dazed and numb, she blocked out the horror until a hand grabbed her, hoisting her up by the hair. Her scalp throbbed in pain. From the sound of it, Father Antonio fought alongside her. In shock, she cried out, Damn it, let go! Even with the blackness around her, she knew who held her firm, yanking her up with little effort. Only one man possessed hatred that ran so deep. In the end... I promised it would be you and me, sweet meat. His raspy whisper taunted her. I told you my voice would be the last thing you hear. I just hope your daddy is watching. The man yanked her to his chest. His stench filled her nostrils. She knew it was only a matter of time. Who would investigate her murder? stare into her glazed eyes. Despite the hopelessness of her situation, Raven would not give in to death. She pitched and rocked her body, straining to free her arms. Then the weight of cold steel pressed against her temple, killing any hope for escape. She would die at the hand of Logan McBride. It had come to this. Chapter 17 Once again, McBride had her bound and gagged with duct tape. She and the priest were hauled to the center of the maze by two of his men. Their deaths would be made a spectacle. She wanted to scream at the injustice. 
But why had they restrained her again? Raven thought back to the Blair case. The man had no evidence of tape on his body. This didn't make sense. She heard McBride's voice through the dark, a fleeting sound, giving instructions to his two mercenaries. Stay hidden. Gonna draw him out. She could make out only fragments of his words. She tried to eavesdrop on the huddled men, their voices too low to hear. Then his demented disciples scurried off into the darkest crevices, like roaches running for cover. But from the sounds of it, his men didn't stray far. Whatever was about to happen would take place center stage. It was obvious a trap had been set. With the men gone, Logan knelt by her side, pulling up the night vision gear to rest on his forehead. The intimacy of his cruel whisper sent a shiver across her skin. Let's put out a little cheese for our rat. Give him the proper motivation. Whom were they going to ambush? Raven didn't like the sound of this conspiracy. She held her breath, gathering courage for what would follow. Suddenly, a beam of light flickered into her eyes, blinding her. After she'd been in the dark for so long, the brightness shot through her brain like needles. She squinted and turned to shield her eyes. McBride yanked her head back and held his gun to her temple. The loudness of his voice took her by surprise. You wanted to play. I got a game for you, he shouted into the void. His insanity pierced her eardrums. Show yourself, or I splatter gray matter dead center. Your choice. Whom was he talking to? Raven wondered. The man had finally lost it. With a sideways glance, she shot a questioning look to the priest. Father Antonio stared into the darkness, his eyes a mix of fear and hope. She followed his lead, searching the gloom. One voice broke the stalemate. A man lingered beyond the narrow circle of light. McBride strafed the emptiness with his flashlight. Let her and the priest go, and I'll stay. Just you and me. The breath caught in her throat. She swallowed hard. It was Christian. How did he? It didn't matter. The sound of his voice filled her with expectation for only an instant. Then reality hit. Christian would walk into McBride's trap, putting himself at risk. And she could do nothing to stop it. Now they'd all die together. She couldn't contain her raw emotion. Raven screamed through the gag, shaking her head, trying to warn him. Logan laughed at her feeble attempt, an insulting cackle. You got nothing to bargain with, my friend. I'm holding a royal flush, ace high. All you got is a pair of twos. Logan set his flashlight onto a burlap sack, shining the beam into the shadows. He jerked her head back hard. Sweat trailed down her cheek as he jammed the gun under her chin. Come out so I can see you. No weapons, hands up. Slowly, Christian stood, squinting into the light with his hands raised. He carefully shrugged out of his coat, then held out his knife in surrender. Toss the knife over the wall, then turn around real slow. The knife clattered on the cement floor outside the labyrinth wall, and with a slow turn to show he carried no other weapons, Christian kept his eyes on McBride. Yet as he stepped closer, Raven detected something else, a fierce determination. She'd seen it the first day they met when he surfaced from the war room. The predator had emerged. Given McBride's ego, she suspected the man believed he had everything under control, and she conceded the odds were stacked in his favor. But Raven wouldn't count Delacourt out. If she were a betting girl, her money would be on Christian. And she hoped Logan McBride would soon find out why. The Asian woman was nowhere in sight. He expected as much. She'd never take on his fight. Still, he could have used her help. The meager glow of the flashlight left much of the warehouse in shadow, but it was enough to bring his plan to a screeching halt. As he stepped into the light, he knew one thing. He'd lost his edge, and now he had no weapon. Yet his eyes remained focused on the man holding Raven. 
Her life would depend upon his instincts and his ability to manipulate a sociopath. What's your name? Christian kept his hands raised, his tone even. I gotta know who would wage war on a priest. The smug look on the man's face faded, twisting into something more sinister. Logan McBride. And while we're on the subject, care to share? Delacourt. Christian Delacourt. Ah, seek the truth, Christian. The man laughed. So we finally meet. Blue Blood will be ticked off when he finds out what I'm gonna do to you. Don't know a man named Blue Blood, but maybe I can help you with your dilemma. His voice low, threatening. Dead men don't have to answer to anyone. You're a cocky son of a bitch. The stare of McBride wavered, his irritation showing. I see you don't carry a gun. The bigger the gun, the smaller the... Well, you know the old saying. A lazy smile spread across Christian's face. His gaze drifted to the glock in McBride's thigh holster. Let's just say I have nothing to prove. Silence. Christian knew the man would have something to prove to the men standing in the rafters. He taunted him with his insolence, daring the man to take up his challenge. McBride would figure that only one alpha male would leave the maze— all he had to do was stall long enough for the police to arrive. Whether he had to kill or not, Christian was determined. Raven would make it out alive. He knew McBride had had enough. The man glared, his jaw tightened. His hands clutched Raven's hair, her eyes filled with pain. It hurt Christian to see her suffer, yet he kept his face unreadable for her sake. Maybe he went too far with the taunts, but McBride would smell weakness and take it out on her. So he decided to push it even further by using the man's ego as a weapon against him, redirecting his hostility. He lowered his hands and crossed his arms over his chest in open defiance, mirroring the mercenary's arrogant expression. By the look in his eye, McBride couldn't resist the pissing match. You look like a guy who enjoys dangerous games. How about we play one? A menacing sneer twisted McBride's face. Just you and me. And you look like a coward, the kind of guy who'd prefer to tip the odds in his favor. Your men won't interfere? Not if I give the order. Turning his head, he yelled over his shoulder. You men on the catwalk, stay put. That's an order. He shrugged then lowered his voice. Good enough. Christian didn't answer. As McBride reached for his flashlight, he slid his night vision gear back in place. And since you like the dark so much, let's make things more interesting. Lights out. Christian caught a motion to his left. Raven shook her head, screaming under the gag, her eyes brimming with terror. The last thing he saw before the lights went out. The darkness came, and with it Christian felt serenity for only an instant, anonymity a welcome change. You're mine now! A raspy voice jabbed his awareness like a sucker punch. You talk too damned much, he taunted and braced for the man's rage. And bring on your dogs, coward. I prefer a challenge. McBride's anger might force a blunder, giving him an edge. It was a theory— for Raven's sake, he hoped the gamble would pay off. By the sounds, three men surrounded him. He crouched, hands held waist-high, ready to move. Slowing his breathing, he shut his eyes, his weight poised on the balls of his feet. His muscles grew taut, ready for the first attack. He didn't have long to wait. A hand grabbed his right elbow, slinging him into the barricade. The sandbags felt rock-hard. It knocked the wind from his lungs. The coarse burlap scraped his chin. A fist punished his back, battering a kidney. Wedged against the stockade, he couldn't move. His arm wrenched by a firm grasp from his first attacker, his shoulder nearly yanked from its socket. The abuse continued. 
Is this the kind of challenge you wanted, smartass? The man whispered at his back. But a familiar sound drew his attention, catching the breath deep in his throat. A knife, unsheathed, slipping from leather. The lethal whisper of a blade. He listened, trusting his instincts. Shoving hard off the wall, he hurled his body into two men. Full force, he rammed his boot into a knee. The crack echoed through the dark, followed by a tortured scream. A man fell hard to the floor. The sound of a low, guttural moan lingered after he crawled deeper into the maze. Christian launched into the man to his left. Ripping off the man's night vision gear, he pitched it over the wall. His fist connected with the mercenary's face, knocking him off balance. Blow after blow, he punished the man's ribs until he doubled over, recoiling from the abuse. Gripping the man's tactical vest at the shoulders, Christian thrust him hard into the barricade. He collapsed to the cement in a heap, unable to get up. But while he focused on the second man, he had lost McBride. With all the sounds of men overhead and the mix of scents in the air, his sensory radar betrayed him. He strained to hear the sound of breathing. Where was McBride? Raising his chin, he sniffed the air. Still nothing. As Christian turned, he felt the knife. A gasp burst from his lips, the thrust stealing his breath. He felt searing heat from the blade as it punctured his belly. His eyes watered with the agony. McBride held him close, stepping in for the kill. The man twisted the blade upward, his breath warm on Christian's face. Oh! Christian cried out. Oh, God! Even through intense pain, he heard Raven's muffled cry, thankful she couldn't see. A bead of sweat trickled down Christian's cheek. It stung his eye as it mingled with a tear. That's gotta hurt. McBride wedged an elbow into his throat, propping him against the wall. The man pulled out the knife, forcing another choked gasp from his lips. You're mine, the whisper mocked him. Don't fight me. Christian smelled the sickening sweet odor of his own blood. His legs grew numb. Only the weight of McBride held him in place. The chill of shock skittered across his shoulders as he sucked air into his lungs. His belly churned hot, slick with blood. He shoved against the man, trying to fight free. But his arms felt heavy and sluggish. Blood loss had taken its toll. All he could think about was Raven. Shh! Just let go. I'll make sure. McBride never finished. The words hung in his throat. The mercenary howled a long, wailing cry, then dropped to the floor. The haunted cry echoed, its sound pulsing through the emptiness, a low murmur of voices too far away to hear. Without McBride to hold him up, Christian slid to the cement, his body deadened. Taunting his senses, he heard the lethal efficiency of a knife thrusting into flesh again and again. He fought for consciousness. What the hell was happening? So focused on the kill, the man never saw it coming. And Jasmine took her time, indulging in the moment. She only wished she'd entered the maze sooner to save Nicky's son from getting stabbed. Not knowing how bad the wound was, she took it out on McBride. The man held her comrade in arms, pinning him to the barricade with a meaty forearm. She crept up behind him, knife poised. The bastard held an advantage with his height and bulk, but Jasmine knew how to remedy that. With a thrusting jab and a powerful slice across, she tore into his hamstring muscles, crippling him. McBride dropped like a rock, shrieking in pain. His terror fueled her with adrenaline. As he rolled onto his back, she kicked the knife from his grip, hearing it clatter across the floor. With conviction, she rammed a knee into his chest, clutching a fistful of his hair. The man quieted long enough for her to speak. 
Blue blood sends his regards. Go to hell, bitch! You first. She slid the knife across his throat, bearing her weight into it. A warm spray baptized her, sticky sweet. The man's body rocked under the pressure, then surrendered to the blade. She committed every detail to memory. Nicky would want to hear it all. A stillness bathed the empty space. Even Raven had stopped thrashing. Christian felt death heavy in the stale air. Then a presence knelt by his side. Soft fingers touched his cheek. A woman's voice whispered, "'You better not die on me, at least not until we've been formally introduced.' In spite of the pain, a smile shaped his lips. My name is... The beautiful Asian woman touched a finger to his lips. Save your strength. I am a patient woman who loves a good mystery. I will find you when the time is right. Her hand traveled down his chest, trailing to his wound. The metallic tang of blood lingered in the air. Hold this in place. Help is on the way. She braced a cloth to his belly, applying pressure to stanch the bleeding. The muffled sound of police sirens filtered through the haze. The cavalry had arrived. He closed his eyes in relief, comforted by her gentle ministrations and soft voice. Then she surprised him. Her lips touched his, stifling his gasp at the intimacy. He resisted, but she held firm ignoring his objection. When she released him, he asked, Why did you? I possess the soul of an ancient warrior and the skill of a thief. I take what I want. She chuckled, a soft feminine sound. I had better leave before your woman discovers me. His woman. He liked the sound of that. The dark eyes of Raven filtered through the shadows, warming him with her light. Not to mention the army of blue outside. The law and I do not always see eye to eye. She fumbled for his hand, placing it on top of the cloth to replace her own. I can't imagine why. Even in his condition, he felt obliged to dole out the sarcasm. You intervened. Saved Raven and the priest. I owe you. From a distance away, her voice found his ear. She had started her prudent retreat. And I will not forget that, my love. There may come a time when I collect on that promise, if you survive. A high-pitched ringing filled his ears, muffling the sound of her voice. As he slumped against the stockade wall, his heartbeat slowed, faintly thrumming in his head. With the blood loss, his sensory skills faltered to nothing. He never heard his mystery woman leave. The police tactical unit rammed the side door. Flashlights strobed the shadows. A dim haze flickered over the stockade wall like a surreal hallucination, the twilight end to a nightmare. The flurry of activity slowed to a crawl before his eyes. Still, Christian caught sight of Raven, tears shimmering on her skin. Or had he imagined her beautiful face? He pictured her dark eyes reflecting the luster from a single candle. Then darkness edged her radiant face, despite his attempt to stop it. Without the strength to pressure his wound, he felt his arm grow numb. His hand collapsed to the floor. He struggled to keep watch over Raven, but failed in the effort. His head too heavy to hold up any longer, he lowered his chin to his chest. With his release, pain ebbed from his body, fading with the rhythm of his shallow breaths. Finally, blackness won. Chapter 18 for an instant, her gaze focused on the light up ahead. Emergency crews hustled to treat the wounded and haul off the dead, their faces bleak with the daunting task, and her fellow officers were busy rounding up the rest of McBride's men. 
The warehouse parking lot was a lesson in controlled chaos. Raven emerged from the darkened belly of the old warehouse, her body racked with pain. Drawing in a deep breath, she remembered how she'd felt just hours before, convinced she'd never make it back from Logan's hell. But Christian hadn't been so lucky. She squinted into the floodlights, holding up her bloodied hand to shield her eyes. With the other, she held Christian, his cold, lifeless fingers clutched in hers. She only hoped he would know she was with him. Strapped to a gurney, he wavered in and out of consciousness as the EMTs transported him to the ambulance. A plastic oxygen mask covered part of his face. Under the spiraling emergency beacons, his skin blanched in the light. A sickly pallor radiated over his skin, spreading like a disease. Seeing him like this, Raven felt a slow panic grip her heart. "'Don't leave me, Christian. Not now.' she whispered for his ears alone, squeezing his hand. As they neared the ambulance, his eyelids opened. The technicians loaded the gurney. Christian's gaze followed her as she stepped into the vehicle and knelt by his side. Are you all right? His voice weak and muffled under the plastic mask, he swallowed hard. He didn't. It pained her to see him striving to be heard through the breathing apparatus. Can I? She gestured to one of the EMTs, asking if she could remove his mask. Just for a minute, then I'm going to need some room to recheck his vitals once we get underway. The man pulled back the blanket covering Christian's bare chest, monitoring his breathing through a stethoscope. He spoke into a radio clamped to his shoulder. Lungs still clear. We'll draw some blood for type and cross-match. We're heading home. The engine to the emergency vehicle rumbled. As they pulled away from the warehouse parking lot, the sirens wailed. The motion of the vehicle jostled Christian. She bent over him, lifting the breathing device. She felt the warmth of his breath on her skin. I'm fine, thanks to you. She touched a finger to his cheek, tears welling in her eyes. You risked everything. For me. Seemed like a good idea at the time. Hurt colored his eyes. How's the priest? Father Antonio was okay, just really shaken. While they were stabilizing you, they took him to the hospital to get checked out. I just wish this never... She choked on her regret. This was all McBride. Don't take responsibility for what that sick bastard. He coughed. Pain surged across his eyes. Oh, God, he gasped. Christian, I can't lose you. Please. A sob lodged in her throat. Don't worry. I'm pr pretty st stubborn. And you owe me dinner, remember? Every word was a struggle, his weakness more pronounced. But even with pain etched on his face, she saw through his attempt at humor, for her benefit, and she loved him all the more for it. How could I forget? Her fingertips longed for the feel of his skin. She gently pressed her lips to his, caressing his face with a hand. Then she gazed into his eyes, laying a palm to his chest to feel the soft, steady beat of his heart. I love you, Christian. What t took you so long? You had me when you ordered me to assume the position. He grimaced, his eyelids drooping. Spread em, scumbag. She pressed a knuckle to her lips, suppressing nervous laughter. I never called you that, she shrugged. I thought it, maybe— she wanted to keep him talking, fearing she might not hear his voice again. Every moment with Christian felt precious, a gift. Raven? He squeezed her hand, straining to stay alert. But he was fading fast. I'm here, Christian. She touched his cheek. I'm not going anywhere. He stared blankly ahead, as if he couldn't see her. Want you to know... If something should 
happen. I'd do it again. No regrets. I love. Slowly, his eyes fluttered closed, his head leaned to one side. Raven held her breath, letting his sweet words wash over her like a cleansing rain. She ran a finger across his lips, then repositioned the oxygen mask. With Christian passed out, she turned to the grim-faced ambulance attendant, trying to hide her fear. What's our ETA? Lakefront Memorial, downtown Chicago. Raven paced the waiting room, bleary-eyed with the late hour. The surgery was taking longer than expected. Christian had been out of her sight more than four hours with no word on his condition. As ominous as that sounded, at least he was still alive. In her mind, no news was good news. Yet for her, time became a boundless chasm, one without a beginning or an end. Images came and went, her perception clouded by a suffocating fear. Would she ever see Christian again? Her thoughts turned to Fiona. In the ER, a nurse took what little patient history she knew of him, then asked a very simple question. Is there anyone we can call? Now would be a good time to contact next of kin. Closing her eyes briefly, Raven filled her lungs to garner strength. No, he has no one. Not any more. The nurse left after a curt nod, the door hissing as it closed behind her. Now the empty waiting room echoed Fiona's betrayal. Alone to endure the vigil, Raven slumped into a chair. She had no idea how to contact the woman. Did Fiona love her son enough to come forward, risking possible arrest for the murder of her husband? Her involvement in the death of Charles Dunhill might never be discovered, but Raven vowed to uncover the truth, especially of Christian. She pushed the thought from her brain. Her mind waged war against the thought of living her future without him. Hell, who was she kidding? Her life began the day they first met. He awakened something in her, something she had never felt before. As she leaned her head back against the wall, tears filled her eyes. She gazed up at the clock as it squandered precious minutes, struggling to keep her eyes open. Shutting them only reminded her of the ordeal she'd barely survived. A motion to her right caught her attention. The waiting room door opened. As Raven turned, a friendly face greeted her. How is he, detective? Father Antonio, please sit. She laid her bandaged hand on the chair next to her, forcing a weary smile. He's still in surgery. Are you okay? Yes, thanks to Mr. Delacourt. I owe him my life. Yes. I just hope— she closed her eyes, demanding her brain to focus on the positive. He was still alive, still in surgery. God does work in mysterious ways. The priest reached for her uninjured hand, tugging at it affectionately. Yes, I've heard that said a lot lately. She smiled. I know it's a cliché, but so true. God had brought your friend to my door on many occasions. I used to be afraid— perhaps intimidated by your Mr. Delacourt. Something in his eyes scared me, like death found refuge in him. But after what he did for us both, I can no longer believe that. I owe him everything. I just hope I get a chance to tell him how I feel. He knows, Father. No, you don't understand, most likely because I'm rambling. The priest glanced down at her hand as he held it, closing his eyes for a moment. He took another breath, then spoke softly. In that room, in the dark, when I was by myself, I could do nothing but think. And I have to admit, I wasn't ready to die. I have never been so scared. He looked up and found her eyes. But when you came, I found the courage to hope. You could have left me behind, but you didn't. I will always be grateful to you for that. Father, you don't have to. Father Antonio raised his hand to stop her. Please let me finish. 
I need to say this to fully grasp it myself. With a blank stare, he gathered his thoughts. When your friend offered his life in place of ours, I have never seen such sacrifice. Except in the Bible, of course. It gave me courage to face my own fear. In that moment, I felt a deeper connection to Christ. And I wasn't afraid any more. I was ready to die. Raven understood the man's epiphany, and she had one of her own. And when I saw what Christian had been willing to sacrifice, it had the opposite effect on me. I just wanted to live. She patted the back of his hand and crooked her lips in a smile. I love him so much, father. An odd sensation came over her. Just a short time ago, Christian had been a complete stranger. Yet now she felt like she'd known him for a lifetime. He had risked everything to save her. Raven knew all she needed to know about the man she loved beyond all reason. The priest's voice drew her back. I think after all we've been through together, you can call me Antonio. A shy grin warmed his face. And you can call me Raven. I hope this is the start of a beautiful friendship, Antonio. With such an auspicious beginning, how can it not? His smile was fleeting. Do you mind if I pray for your friend? His simple request took a moment to sink in. Tears brimmed in her eyes as she nodded. She had no words for how she felt. Praying for Christian felt more like last rites. The finality of it scared her. Yet having Antonio by her side gave comfort all the same, a strange contradiction. Raven watched the priest mouth the words. The meaning clouded her mind. His familiar mantra soothed her, but an unsettling feeling of dread lurked beneath the surface of his kindness. A tear lost its grip and dropped to her cheek. She closed her eyes to shake the feeling, but a noise drew her attention. Raven turned her head toward the sound. As if in slow motion, the waiting room door opened once more. A man dressed in faded green stepped into the room. Raven swallowed hard. Expectation took its toll. Her heart punished her eardrums, a rapid, incessant beat. She gazed upon the doleful expression of a surgeon, his eyes depleted and unreadable. Oh, please, no! She cried, her voice drained of faith. She gripped the hand of the priest. Antonio, I can't do this. I just can't. Chapter 19 St. Sebastian's Chapel, Five Months Later Raven pulled the coat tighter around her neck as she walked, fending off the lingering chill in the morning air. The ground gave way with each step, still saturated from the runoff of melting snow. As blades of brown grass poked through, she noticed they were infused with tender green sprouts, a hint of the coming spring. She pushed open the wrought-iron gate that encircled the cemetery at St. Sebastian's. It creaked in protest and clanged when she shoved it closed behind her. This early on a Sunday morning, the cemetery was empty except for a tall, dark-haired man and a petite woman wearing a black hat, a veil covering her face. Dressed in long, dark coats, they stood with heads bowed, their backs to her. The image of grief left a memorable impression. She lowered her head, her gaze focused. In reverence, she neared the headstone marked Delacourt, then crouched in front of his. Raven ran a gloved finger along each letter, giving thanks to the man for his selfless act of courage. He had changed her life and touched so many others. Looking at the date on the marker, she commemorated his birthday with a dozen long-stemmed white roses, removing one for herself. As she stood, the fragrance of a single white rose filled her nostrils. Its velvety softness touched the tip of her nose. But she hadn't been the first to pay respects. 
A colorful batch of fresh flowers had already been placed on the grave, along with a new doll, replacing a worn, tattered one. The tiny cloth toy looked so lost in this place of death, a sad reminder of Christian's tragedy. It broke her heart. Closing her eyes, she lowered her head to say a prayer. I'm glad you could make it. His rich baritone brought a smile to her lips. Before she turned, Raven drank in the familiar honey of his voice, committing the sound to memory. It means a lot to me that you're here, Raven. Christian stepped closer, pulling her into his embrace. His hand cradled the back of her head as he nuzzled her neck, the tip of his nose cold to the touch. Thanks for celebrating my father's birthday with me. I wouldn't miss it, honey, she whispered into his ear, then kissed his cheek. If it weren't for your father's courage and sacrifice, I wouldn't have you. Releasing her, he gazed into her eyes as if he were absorbing every detail of her face. No words were necessary. He trailed a finger down her cheek, then brushed back a strand of hair. For her, the chill in the air disappeared and the cemetery faded into nothingness. Only her connection to Christian lingered. She had come close to losing him. Raven had so much to be thankful for. The chief officially made me close the Blair case. Well, you said yourself, McBride confessed to killing Mick. Yeah, but my gut is in a knot over this one. Logan was more connected to my father than to anything dealing with your past. It just doesn't make any sense. Something feels wrong. And when I asked the reason why he killed Blair, McBride said professional courtesy. What's that all about? The man enjoyed his head games. Maybe that's all it was. I mean, he and Mickey were both hired guns, right? Maybe it was a case of doing away with the competition. But why tie this to you and to Fiona? Yeah, that's been bugging me, too. And McBride mentioned the name Blue Blood, like I would know the reference. I'd never heard it before that day. He narrowed his eyes in thought, then heaved a sigh. Seek the truth, Christian. Guess the truth doesn't always set you free. And that's another thing. The phrase about seeking the truth, it's way too sophisticated for a scumbag like McBride. The man was a pig. The subtlety of that message would have been lost on the goon. Raven laid a gloved hand to his coat sleeve and squeezed his arm. How is Fiona these days? You haven't talked about her in a while. She's putting up a good front, but I know better. Fee's got a court date in three weeks. His eyes filled with pain as he reached for her hand. With all her financial resources, I figured she would have contested the charges. But after she confessed, all she wanted was an opportunity to get her affairs in order before... He shook his head. I don't know how she's going to do the prison time. And how are you doing? With her, I mean. He grimaced, then stared off toward the church. She still refuses to tell me who my biological father is. It's like she's protecting me from something. I just don't get it. Frustration tinged his voice. She's admitted so much. Why hold back on this? Give her time, honey. She's got a lot on her mind. It took courage to admit what she'd done. And without any real evidence against her, she could have skated on the charges. Yet she chose to do the right thing. That took guts. Christian looked deep in thought as he put his arm around her. He led her toward the church, walking at an unhurried pace. Yeah, that it did. But knowing what she did still hurts too much. Maybe I'm the one needing a little time. She stepped in front of him, bracing her hands on his elbows. Standing before him, Raven gazed into his expressive eyes, cherishing the miracle of his existence. And I'm so glad you have it, that we have time. I thought for sure that I'd lost you. Now every minute we have together, it's a gift, Christian. You make it sound like I'm living on borrowed time. A lazy smile graced his handsome face for an instant, then faded. My life had been balanced on a single point in time. I couldn't move forward, and I couldn't go back and change it. I'd been held hostage to that one dark moment. But now I feel more alive than I ever thought I could be. 
and I have you to thank for that. He pulled her to his chest, wrapping his arms around her. The subtle fragrance of his cologne fused with the irresistible scent of his skin, filling her senses. He lowered his lips to hers. Raven shut her eyes, wanting to feel every nuance of his kiss. Slowly, his lips explored hers with an unrivaled sweetness. But his tender show of affection soon gave way to hungry need, matching her own. She belonged to Christian as surely as he carried the mark of her love. Raven had never felt so loved. Father Antonio walked briskly through the breezeway with only the soft rustle of his cassock and the sound of his footsteps to keep him company. Morning rays of sunlight filtered through the arched windows along the corridor, suspending dust particles in the warm light. A change of season from winter to spring always lifted his spirits. Movement from the cemetery below caught his eye. He stopped for a look. Squinting into the light, the priest grinned at the sight of Christian and Raven in each other's arms. The moment of déjà vu gave him a feeling of contentment. Everything had come full circle. He was pleased to see Christian standing in the light of day. The significance of this was not missed on him. Death no longer haunted his new friend. A woman's love reflected in his eyes now. "'You've awakened the voice of your heart, Christian. Perhaps in her eyes—' You'll find the peace you've been looking for. I hope so, my friend. Eager to share the significance of this day with his friends, he turned to leave. But the sight of two strangers compelled him to stop. An elegantly dressed man in a long dark coat stood in the tree line along the wrought iron fence. A stunning young Asian woman stood by his side. Her face looked familiar, but he couldn't quite place it. A feeling of dread slowly crept into his mind, tainting his optimism. After his unfounded misgivings about Christian, he should have dismissed the silly notion about these strangers. But the man and woman held his attention with their peculiar behavior. Intent on only one thing, they stood along the periphery of the cemetery with eyes fixed on Christian and Raven. They had no interest in any of the headstones, nor did they hold any tokens of remembrance in their hands. And their eyes had not wavered. They continued to stare at the lovers. He furrowed his brow, then breathed a sigh. Not very charitable, Antonio. He shook his head, chastising himself as he turned from the window. Had he not learned a thing about standing in judgment of another human being? Jasmine's gaze drifted toward the man by her side. Staring beyond the shadows, Nicholas stood with his hands in the pocket of his overcoat. His jaw flinched in controlled anger. And how did you know he would be here today? His voice lacked emotion, but Jasmine knew otherwise. The birth date on the tombstone for John Delacorte. I suspected Christian might pay his respects to the man who— she cut herself short, unsure how he would take her presumption. Today is the man's birthday. You know I am not pleased that you kept this little bit of information from me, the fact that I have a son. Slowly his eyes found hers. Normally his expression disclosed nothing of his true nature, but today he allowed an unbridled contempt to rise to the surface. His look of disdain shot through her like a deadly jolt of electricity. She swallowed, fighting against the lump in her throat. In all the years she had known him, Jasmine had denied her affection and dependence on a man as ruthless as her Nicky. But perhaps deep in her mind she knew this day would come, when she could no longer deny the love she felt for him. Love meant vulnerability, a weakness she could not afford. I was concerned for you, actually, she postured. Her bold move captured his complete focus. Oh? His glare was tinged with curiosity. How so? Such sentimentality is beneath you, Nicky. She hoped her curt remark would be enough explanation. Jasmine stared straight ahead, avoiding his eyes. Slowly he raised his chin and returned his attention to the sight of Christian leaving the cemetery with the police detective, 
heading for the chapel. You may be right, he agreed. Jasmine ventured a look, catching the subtleties of his smile. But Nicky was not done. I would never be suitable father material, but I resent the implication that Theona concurred. She never allowed me to come to my own conclusions on the subject. And that, my dear, is inexcusable. Jasmine's worst fear was realized. Nicholas would not let this go. Calmly, she slid her arm into his. Ever the gentleman, he allowed the gesture. He escorted her back to his limousine parked on the street. What will you do, Nicky? She found herself holding her breath. Revenge is an act of passion, Mantis. A haunting laughter rolled from his chest. And as you know, I am a very passionate man. Jasmine knew exactly what he meant. This concludes the reading of No One Left to Tell by Jordan Dane. Copyright 2008 by Kosas Finas, LLC. This book was read by Tavia Gilbert. This unabridged recording was published by arrangement with HarperCollins Publishers and was produced in 2008 by Blackstone Audio, Inc., which holds the copyright. Neither this recording nor any portion of it may be reproduced or used for any purpose without prior written authorization from Blackstone Audio, Inc. If you would like to obtain a complete catalog of our titles or our monthly update telling you about new releases and our new collection of books on CD and MP3 CD, call 1-800-SAY-BOOK. That's 1-800-729-2665. You may also obtain the same information from our award-winning website. Our address, all one word, is www.blackstoneaudio.com. Thank you.